phosphorus. It is like sulfur, an element that is with Ewald since more than 35 years in research. And most of the data I will present today, you will find in the book Phosphorus in Agriculture, 100% zero. So what seems like a contradiction, 100% zero, can be explained very briefly. A long-term, complete, says 100%, utilization of applied phosphorus without, speaking zero, increasing the content of hazardous components in the soil. The doctrine for phosphorus fertilization under temperate regions is that in a healthy soil, the complete utilization of applied phosphorus can be assumed over infinite times if, first, this phosphorus is applied in degradable organic forms or if it is in mineral forms, is completely soluble in water or in neutral ammonium citrate, and if the soil phosphorus level is sufficient so that any phosphorus fertilization will show no yield response. Under these conditions, phosphorus fertilization may just replenish the amount of phosphorus that has been removed by harvest products. Meanwhile, 11 years ago, peak phosphorus was the hot topic, not only in science, but also in the newspapers. And our colleagues from Switzerland, Andrea Ulrich and Emmanuel Frossat, they compiled this com uh, complex uh, table you see here. Let me have a look where, uh, sorry, uh, the, the table here. And what you see is, are data about the estimates on the longevity of phosphate rock. When you go back to the 1930s, the estimate was that the phosphate rock will be enough for the next 43 years. That is the middle value. And then uh, in the 1940s, the estimate was between 10 and 20,000 years. And when you see at the latest data at the bottom, I can't find the laser pointer here. Uh, then from von Kovenberg in 2010, it says something between three and 400 years. And in principle, it doesn't matter how long the reserves will be sufficient because they are finite. And this means that we have to make sure that we have a sustainable use of phosphorus it is imperative, and this not only regionally, but on a global scale. So facing these limited reserves of mineral phosphorus, you see on this slide what the New Zealanders call a cow motorway with more than 1,000 animals. And here you see a severe problem we have in conventional agriculture. Here the manure is not gold, it's more a waste product. And that is a problem because it causes phosphorus accumulation in soil. It was Carpenter and co-workers in the late 1990s who stated that on a regional and global scale, the causes and consequences of non-point pollution are clear. And I think Ewald can confirm that because he was for more than 10 years the chairman of the Working Group Agriculture of the Helsinki Commission in order to protect nutrient loads uh, to the Baltic Sea. And this is our main problem. And what you see on the next slide is the plant available phosphorus content in the top soils within Europe. What is black and blue are hotspots of phosphorus accumulation. And uh, you can see you find the typical candidates in North and Germany and also in the Netherlands and parts of Finland. And what the authors, Toth and co-workers, found out is that these hotspots coincide with the highest livestock densities. So we had a EU-financed project, Baltic Manure, and what we do it in the member states of the Baltic Sea, we collected soil samples from neighboring fields, one field belonging to an arable farm, the other field always belonging to a livestock farm, and what you can see on this photo here, the northerly field, you see the yellow dots, and that means the phosphorus supply in the topsoil is in an optimum state. 
In the southerly field, where you have exclusively the application of manure and mineral fertilizers, you see you have an excess of phosphorus, and this excess can be very strong. So where does this leave us? Is it that we have to face, on the one side, on arable farms, phosphorus deficiency, and on the other side, we have uh, phosphorus eutrophication because where you have an accumulation of phosphorus in soil, the risk for surface runoff and erosion will increase propor uh, proportionally. And you have to say, yes, it is not five to midnight, it's five past midnight, and we need stringent measures in order to turn back time. And next, I would like you to show the first steps in order to do so. What you see on the next slide is data for the annual phosphorus demand and consumption of, uh, in Germany. The total phosphorus demand for primary production, that is the feed, food, and the mineral fertilizer sector is 560,000 tons. Manure and slurry, slurry provide 236,000 tons. Sl sewage sludge and meat bone meal, roughly 10% and mineral fertilizers uh, account for 25% of our annual demand. This means Germany is dependent on imports of mineral phosphorus, and it means we are sensitive to any increases in the price like we've seen it in 2008. The amount of phosphorus required for fertilization depends on the utilization of fertilizer phosphorus, and that is something I want to like to describe in more detail. When we apply phosphorus, the behavior after incorporation can be summarized. So we have no interaction with the atmosphere. The mobility is very low and significant losses occur not by uh, leaching but by surface runoff and erosion. After solubilization, the transformation into site-specific phosphorus species undergoes successive crystallization. Plants are capable of utilizing aging fertilizer products despite their decreasing solubility. And finally, the fixation and desorption processes are in an equilibrium. So when we put these words into a figure, you see that on the next slide. And on the left, you see the plant uptake, which occurs exclusively in form of dissolved phosphates. The fertilizer phosphorus, Gerold mentioned it this morning, in particularly in organic farming, you have the problem where you are only allowed to use rock phosphate. The problem is when you use rock phosphates or crushed bones that they are not soluble. And that is indicated here that they do not take part in the soil dynamics. And the best example is Rothamsted Experimental Station, which was founded 1843 three by uh, John Bennett Laws, <laughs> and uh, what he did is he digested bones with sulfuric acid and he could show that the plant availability of phosphorus increased significantly. Later on the product was superphosphate that came out. So it is important, like I said it in my introduction, that we apply phosphorus in a form that is plant available. Then you have the organic and inorganic uh, phosphorus pool, and in both pools you have easy mineralizable phosphorus and slowly mineralizable phosphorus, and there is a steady uh, exchange between these pools. When we want to know what is the actual and the apparent phosphorus, phosphorus utilization rate, the actual rate can be determined by calculating the phosphorus offtake of the fertilized crop, subtracting the phosphorus offtake of the control and divided by the fertilizer rate. The isotopic tracer methods, they have a slight problem because we have only one stable phosphorus isotope, phosphorus 31, and we have two radioactive isotopes, phosphorus 32 and 33. And uh, these two radioactive isotopes have a short half-life. That means you can only conduct pot experiments. <coughs> and the reason why we cannot prove in the field the intrinsic concept of 100% 
utilization is that phosphorus is anisotopic and uh, as I pointed out before and the apparent phosphorus utilization says that the total phosphorus offtake equals the fertilizer rate meaning it's 100 percent. In practice in, uh, the data show that the actual fertilizer utilization rate is about 15% in the year of application. This difference method applied in field experiments over a long period of time shows that it is 75% and when we come to the apparent phosphorus utilization rate, it is 100%. So when we put it in a figure, you see here indicated by capital D that is the fertilizer rate in the year of application and the small letter D is its corresponding utilization rate. But the farmer has applied phosphorus in the years before and this is indicated by B1, B2 until Bn and the phosphorus from these previous fertilizer application rates has also corresponding phosphorus values in the soil and accordingly utilization coefficients. With C, we have indicated the soil, the native soil phosphorus stock, and the small letter C is accordingly the utilization coefficient. When we put this pi into a formula, you see that here on this slide, D is, as said before, the fertilizer rate. B is the actual phosphorus fertilizer application and its utilization. C, that of the native soil pool. And when we now want to know what is the apparent phosphorus fertilization that is abbreviated with the letter S, I said before, it's composed of the actual phosphorus fertilizer application and its utilization coefficient and the phosphorus fertilizer applications of all the previous years before. The fertilizer rate itself can be determined when we know the offtake of our crop for the target yield we opt for and when we subtract the amount of unavoidable losses. And these unavoidable losses are by leaching, it's by erosion and it's by immobilization. So when we solve the equation for one, you get the third line here and when we incorporate the native soil stock of phosphorus, like you see it here, you have uh, the equation but when our losses and our unavoidable losses are tending towards zero and are negligible, then the apparent phosphorus utilization S is just a factor of the offtake and the fertilizer rate, and it's 100%. So Jack Reacher would say simple math. So on this slide here, you see a fertilizer experiment that is in principle capable of delivering the proof for a 100% utilization of phosphorus. It has been developed by Engelstadt and Parks in 1976. And you concentrate here on the numbers. One would be the fertilizer rate based on the actual fertilizer application and utilization rate, where we have seen it's 15% in the year of application. And this means when we follow that concept, we will have a steady increase in the soil phosphorus content. When we apply the concept of apparent phosphorus <coughs> utilization, number two, we can see that we have a steady state of our soil phosphorus content. And three is our control, meaning if we apply no, soil, uh, no phosphate, of course our uh, soil phosphorus content will decline. In this context, the soils I've shown you in the excessive phosphorus status, we calculated it will take at least 70 years if you apply no phosphorus so that the level decreases from excess phosphorus to sufficient supply. So why can't I see anything? Okay, you can see something here. Uh, there have been some field experiments, long-term, seven years in Germany, carried out by Schachtschabel and Bergmann and Witter here from the 1965s. And what you see, blah, sorry, what have I done? 
<laughs> what you see with P1, that is the treatment where phosphorus was applied following the concept of apparent phosphorus utilization. And when you can't concentrate on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the lines here, you can see that you can maintain the soil phosphorus sta uh, status uh, on a constant level by following this approach, meaning that it is possible to achieve 100% utilization in the field on fertile soils by adopting the uh, hypothesis of army Kyla of apparent utilization. The next step would be that we put this information into algorithms for the variable rate application of fertilizers. We've developed them for mineral and also for organic fertilizers. But much more important with a view to manure is that in the EU regulation, there is not only an upper limit for nitrogen, it's currently 170 kilograms per hectare, but also for phosphorus. And that, the Swedish colleagues have done that. Um, uh, it's only allowed to apply with manure 22 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus. And that is exactly the average value for phosphorus offtake by crop products. So we deal, dealt with the topic of 100%. Now I will short, shortly uh, address the topic of contamination. We've had, uh, we've analyzed mineral phosphorus fertilizers, feed and food phosphates, as you can see in the table, for different elements, where for mineral phosphorus phosphorus fertilizers, we have tentative limit values and we have limit values for feed and food phosphates. What you can see is that none of the samples exceeded the tentative limit value for cadmium of 50 milligram per kilogram per two or five, and also not in the food and feed phosphates. But we see that we have 4.5% of the samples which exceeded the tentative limit value for uranium and 7% in case of the food phosphates. When you have a look at the data, you see that 3.3% uh, of the samples uh, exceeded the limit value for arsenic and it was the same value for, for food phosphates. So it seems somehow more difficult to extract uh, arsenic uh, from the rock phosphate. When we now have a look at the annual loads delivered uh, by uh, fertilizers for cadmium and uranium, expectedly you see we have the highest uh, loads and quantities here. It's 2,500 kilograms for uranium for Germany and uh, 300 kilograms for cadmium. And in a ratio of 12 to 3 to 1, this value decreases from the fertilizers to the feed and food phosphates. So this decline along the chain, soil plant, feed animal, and food human, does not say anything about the actual transfer along this chain. So when I summarize the results, we have seen it is possible to achieve 100% utilization of mineral phosphorus fertilizers. And ecosphere, I don't know who of you ever possessed an ecosphere, it's a quite tricky system. They provide evidence for the successful operation of closed phosphorus cycles. And with view to cadmium or uh, uranium, we have seen that the majority of mineral fertilizer samples are below the tentative limit values. So this leaves me with to thank you for listening and this leaves me also to thank Ewald for the trust he placed in me almost four decades ago. <clears throat> and I want to thank you for your contagious enthusiasm and for your ability to literally see a world in a grain of sand, as William Blake wrote it so touchingly in Auguries of Innocence. Thank you.
Uh, okay, so my question is on your, you're talking about the uh, calculations of the utilization rates of phosphorus, right? Yes. And so <clears throat> wouldn't that be influenced by the source of the phosphorus that's being used? So you have to know release rates to know utilization rates, or did I misconstrue that? I think you missed the beginning. It says that we, you have to use phosphorus either in water-soluble form or in ammonium citrate-soluble form or as manure. Then you can assume that this phosphorus is 100% plant available. When you, for instance, take rock phosphate, yeah. you can f simply forget it. Okay. And then when you have this uh, assumption, then you can calculate the uh, fertilizer rates, yeah? the utilization rates, sorry. Any more questions? Please. Yes. So, uh, thank you, Silvia, for this um, great presentation. Uh, before the overlook, Oh, uh, more than 150 years of foster for phosphorus research in agriculture. So my question was, uh, we have a discussion now and also in the context of the new uh, European fertilizer regulation, which open up, opens up the uh, markets also for recycled phosphor, for phosphorus products. Uh, and so my question is, uh, how is, uh, in the context of 100 to 0 um, revision, uh, how do you see the function of this recycled, recycled phosphorus? Um, are there also 100% uh, soluble uh, over the long term period? And are there also poor contaminants? I think the question should be, do we have the same demands? And I say yes. Otherwise, it makes no sense. You, you will apply phosphorus that is not fully plant available, so it's also a waste of a resource. So we must have the same demands towards recycled phosphorus products. The same with the contaminants, yes. And when you have recycled products, you have not only the heavy metals, you have also the xenobiotics. And that is uh, uh, really the, the box of Pandora when you open that. <laughs>